hitting a belt buckle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about uh, the Allen Bow geography of ground beetles and uh, potential mechanistic explanations for species area relationships. So the species area relationship is probably one of the most widely spread patterns in ecology and generally describes the increase in the number of species with the area sampled. And there have been a number of mechanistic explanations proposed for this pattern. So there's two that propose that area per se is the principal driving factor, and these are the equilibrium hypothesis proposed by MacArthur and Wilson, or the, the island biogeography theory, which proposes that the number of species on an island is the product of some quasi-equilibrium between immigration rates, which are influenced by isolation, and extinction rates, which are influenced by the size of the island. The second is the sampling hypothesis, and it was, this was put forth by McConnor and McCoy. And basically, the idea is that larger islands serve as larger, larger interception targets, such that species distributing from some mainland source will be intercepted by larger islands, and so they have more <coughs> species. In contrast to these two area-driven hypotheses, uh, the habitat diversity hypothesis says that it's actually this habitat heterogeneity that we get with increasing area that drives the pattern. So if you increase area, you invariably increase the number of habitats that you sample, and it's these spe extra species that you get in these new habitats that are part of what's driving this pattern. So as you might expect, teasing apart these mechanistic explanations can be quite tough. And Dr. Johan Kotze uh, exemplifies this in his, his review of island uh, carabid studies in the Baltics in 2008. And he says, evidence is divided on whether habitat diversity or area per se is responsible for the increased number of species found on large Baltic islands. So in an effort to address this question, uh, we studied a large boreal glacial lake in northern Saskatchewan, Canada. So this was work that I did as part of my master's. It focused on Lac La Ronge, which is roughly about 1,500 square kilometers, so just under 1,000 uh, square miles, I think. My math is right. Um, and rather than sampling the entire island and therefore incorporating many habitats, we used a fixed approach where we sampled just one habitat type. So in this case, it was upland forest. And the idea here was that rather than uh, including multiple habitats with increasing area, we wanted to sort of control for macro habitat diversity. Now, carabids are, of course, influenced a lot by microhabitat traits, but just hold on to that thought for a second. So we sampled upland forests, and we used a standardized method of eight pitfall traps along a 120-meter transect so that we could compare between islands. And we also sampled a variety of habitat characteristics at each site. So under this macro habitat uh, controlling idea, or by just sampling the upland conifer forests, we have two possible outcomes. Either we can uh, still continue to see a significant species area relationship, in which case we would conclude that area per se is, is responsible, or is at least somewhat important, or we could have we no longer have a species area relationship, in which case maybe habitat is in fact more important than area per se. So consider these two. And what we actually find is the latter. So here on the x-axis we have island area, and here on the y-axis we have uh, species richness. And you can see from the scattering of points and the, the non-significant p-value and weak r squared that we don't actually see this relationship. So this suggests that area per se may not be important, but in fact habitat diversity may be. So taking this one step further, I mentioned those microhabitat characteristics that we collected at each site. So what I did was I used an ordination to basically condense these variables down to a working number. So uh, essentially just picked out the variables that were driving the largest variation or habitat heterogeneity. And then if we uh, take these variables and we compare them in a multi-hypothesis framework, so we used AIC weights, and the idea here is uh, it gives you the probability or the, the support for a model given the data and the models examined. So here we have 
just a null model with a fixed intercept. We have the sampling hypothesis, which again, the principal factor here would be area. Then we have island biogeography, which would be area and isolation. Yeah, and then uh, again, we have, now we're considering the microhabitat diversity. And so the, the factors that came out of the ordination were moss, coarse woody debris, basal area, and tree and shrub cover. And what we actually see is that even within a single micro, macro habitat, we have micro habitat variables driving the greatest, uh, or explain, best explaining the diversity in ground beetles on islands. So this suggests that habitat diversity is, is pretty important. Thanks. Very cool. Come on. So in, in essence, you would have sort of like your edge specialists on the side and things like that? Or, um, the, the islands are, so they're, they're metamorphic rock and the, the, there isn't really any edge habitat. I mean, there's definitely the sort of border between the rock and the forest, but we focus most of the sampling quite a bit from the edge as much as we could. So at least, you know, we definitely weren't within five meters of the edge, usually at least about 20 meters or so away from the edge in the island. Do you keep, do you keep track of those data? How far away? Uh, yep, yep, yeah, yeah, we could, well, we could measure it quite easily. Like I have the position of every trap and things like that, yep. Yeah. Any other questions? Colin? How, how um, maybe on one island, because you focus on one habitat, maybe you have one island within the island. In, in what sense? Like, how, how island size reflect habitat size? Well, but we control for that by sampling a fixed habitat yes, size on each that's, island. That's my point. Maybe a big island would, would have lo a lot more of the other habitat. And really, your big island would, it would be equivalent to a medium island because the, the amount of same habitat that you have, it's about the same. So, like, I guess, so there's, there's upland conifer forests, and those dominate the island. So the, and then there's, in some cases, small beaches and the occasional bog. But I, so you'd say, rather than taking the, the, area, the full area of the island, take the full area of the, the upland conifer forest. Yes. I, I suspect the areas would be very similar. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I guess one way to look at that would be to, 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 to go back again, if you have the money, yeah. and look at species in these different right. areas on the islands. And yes. See how much, how, how is that organized? And then compare the two, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, that'd be, yeah. I guess you're saying in a perfect Are you saying you have some money? <laughs> <laughs> Terry. Aaron, um, what if you work in a place where you can't count the microhabitats? In terms of? In terms of the Amazon well, forest. <laughs> well, I think even here, what we see is not what the beetle sees, right? And that's kind of what I was trying to get at with this picture is, like, that's one, you can't, we can't count the habitat. I don't think we can. So the best I think we can do is count the macro habitat and then try our best to measure the micro habitat and then use that. But I would agree with you that like trying to trying to count the hab micro habitat is very difficult. Come on. Yeah, I, don't, I may have missed it, but do you keep track of how isolated the islands were from each other? Yep. The, yep. So we use we use two methods. We used uh, nearest distance, and then we always used we also used a series of um, buffers, which sort of took into account how clustered the islands were and how big the clustering of the islands were. And surprisingly. Uh, Actually, the nearest distance, so just the flat distance to mainland, seemed to perform better um, in the analysis, which is not typically what you would find. You would usually find that the more, you know, sort of buffer-centric and more sort of complex analysis would be better, but it wasn't. Dave? Um, 15 seconds. Many, flight, many flightless uh, carabins on these islands? Yeah, actually, we're working on a chapter right now 
paper because I'm done my thesis, but uh, on the smallest islands, we have fewer Brachypterus and large-bodied species. And actually, we, we're seeing in Agonum retractum, which is a, a dimorphic species, we're actually seeing a significant relationship between the Macropterus types on the small islands compared to the large islands. So Agonum retractum is not only more likely to be Macropterus if it's female, so it's sex-linked, but it's more likely to be Macropterus if it's on a small island than a large island. So do you think these islands and their occupation predate the lake formation or they disperse there? They disperse there, definitely. Isolation does not, and that's similar to the Baltic studies, isolation does not seem to be limiting at all on this scale. So the, the furthest island from the mainland was 10.7 kilometers. So just over six miles, I guess. <laughs>